again a warm welcome from my side to this SAP community call. My name is Svea Becker and I'm part of the SAP community team. And today we have the um, call about introducing introduction to Git enabled CTS. And with me today here is Karin. Um, it's currently her second call in this series. And Karin works um, in product management team for cloud and lifecycle management at SAP. And she focuses on topics around transporting ABAP and non-ABAP. Welcome Karin to today's SAP community call. Yeah, thank you very much Svea. And welcome everyone who is attending the call. So yeah, as Svea already said today, I would like to give you an introduction to TCTS, show you a bit how it works. And I hope that in the end, we will still have time for questions. I'll try to answer them as good as I can. And if something remains, I'm also in the community, you can ping me, you can send me questions so that you get hopefully into the topic and get your questions clarified. So with that, and as I made some bad experiences last time, I will now turn off my video <laughs> to make sure that I can use my bandwidth for the transmission of the sound and the slides and so on. Okay. So yeah, first of all, I'd like to give you some basic introduction what GCTS is about. So the very basic idea is that you can use a Git repository to store your ABAP development. So we will start in your development system. You will create new ABAP objects or whatever. And then when you release the transport request, you could push these objects to a Git repository. This means you would be connected to this repository with your development system and connected to this repository with your test and production system, for example. With these two test and production, you can then take a look into your Git repository, check what is there and get the coding of the latest commit, whatever you did, deployed into your test and production system. So that's the very basic idea that you do not have the transport routes anymore as you might know them from CTS, from the classical change and transport system, but that you can use Git to manage your sources. So that's also how we ended up with the name of GCTS. So we have the classical CTS still in the background. We will see later on how we edit it to Git somehow. So we made it possible to use Git and that's how or why we named it GCTS or Git enabled CTS. One important thing maybe in the beginning. So GCTS is something that you can use. You don't have to decide for all your development to go for GCTS right now. You can start with one package or whatever, try out how GCTS feels like, check how the development process now looks like or feels like, and then continue with new packages later on. For all the others that are not using GCTS up to that point of in time, you can use the classical CTS in parallel. So it's not one or the other, both can be run in parallel. And it's also, if you come to the conclusion at the end of this presentation or whenever the GCTS is not what you need, it's also not the case that we are going to replace the classical CTS. It will stay as it is. You can use it, bugs will be fixed and so on. So there is nothing like deprecation of classical CTS or whatever. It is there and if it's the good solution for you, stay with it. GCTS is just an option. The way how you could manage to get ABAP into the modern world of DevOps or CICD processes. So how could a CICD process look like with ABAP? First, the developers for sure have to develop something that needs to go through a system landscape. And the developers continue working as they are used to. So they will use ADT or SEAT for creating ABAP objects, for changing them. They will use SPRO for customizing stuff, and they will use SS09 for managing the transport requests. So all of these tools stay in place. The developer starts with creating a transport request or he gets one announced or yeah, by his development lead. Then he changes stuff, he does some customizing, he creates new objects and tracks all these changes in transport requests. When he finished his development, he can release the transport request. So up to there, not really a change. The process stays the same. But when you release the transport request, that's where the new stuff comes into the game. So you would release the transport request 
And if GCDS is enabled for this transport request, you will see later on how this works, the changes will not, or the transport request will not be pushed into the import queue of the next system, but the changes will be pushed to the repository on GitHub as a new commit. After that, you could use a CI server, continuous integration server that observes this repository. And if something new arrives, it can do some tests or whatever you would like to do on this CI server by the help of a pipeline. And it can then, if tests are okay on the QA system, after the deployment to the QA, um, check how to continue. So it could send feedback to the developer whether everything was okay. If something was detected, so if the tests in the CI pipeline reported errors, the developer could start again, fix his issues, get the feedback again, so repeat this cycle until the coding is fine. And as soon as it's fine, the pipeline could go ahead and push, or you could do it manually, it's depending how you set up um, your pipeline, push things into the production system, so some kind of continuous deployment. That would mean that you could, for example, use two branches, so one branch for this development cycle and another branch for the production system. As soon as you are okay with your coding in this CI cycle, you could do a merge into the branch for the production system and then automatically or whatever, pull this stuff into the production system and by this, make the new coding available to your productive users, to your business users, which means that all the objects that are part of the pull request will be imported into the ABAP runtime and will be activated. So that's how a basic CI CD process for ABAP could look like. What do you need to be able to set up a process like this? So what you absolutely have to have for sure is some ABAP systems. It's not a must that you have three. That's just a classical example of having a development, a test and a production system. It can be any other landscape, but for sure you need some ABAP systems. And you have to have a Git repository. So it can be different Git platforms. The example that we will use today will run on GitHub. GCTS can run with these two. So with the ABAP systems and with the Git platform. But if you like to automate your processes, like it's very common in DevOps processes, you for sure need a CI server. So we will use Jenkins for that today. And on this CI server, you would need to set up the pipelines. What do you need to install on these systems? So for Git, there's nothing special that you need to install. It can be different platforms, but there's nothing that you need to specially configure or create or whatever or install on the ABAP systems. You have to have SAP S4 HANA 1909 at least. So that's the first release where GCTS was delivered. In lower releases, you cannot use it. If you would like to use GCTS also for customizing, then you have to have S4 HANA 2020 in place. In addition, on each of these ABAP systems, you need a Java 1.8. It could be, for example, the SAP machine version 11. If you don't use that, then you could, any other JRE of at least, as I said, version 1.8 is required. In addition, we have some notes. You will also see later on what some of these notes can bring as a benefit to your system. So we have some notes that have to be implemented on these systems as well. For the CI server, we don't have any special requirements. So you don't need to install any plugin or whatever Jenkins might provide. We just use the pure basic of Jenkins. We provide some pipeline steps as examples in Project Piper. I will show you that later on. So that's an example how you could set up the pipeline and how you could implement the different steps of deployment and executing unit tests and so on. I will give you more details later on. So after this installation part, you do have to do for sure some configurations. On the Git side, you need a repository and that repository should have an initial commit because this is how then the connection is established to do an initial cloning and so on. So we need some content in this. With the initial commit, with the readme, that's completely fine. On the ABAP systems, we need Fiori. So if Fiori is already enabled in your systems, in your ABAP systems, then you're fine. If not, then you would need to do all of this Fiori enablement. 
because GCTS comes with a GCTS Fiori app, which is required to be able to work on the commits, to work on the repositories, to see what's going on, to view the logs and so on. So you need this Fiori UI. You need to assign it to your users. And it also comes with different authorizations. So we provide a special role that you could use as a template, copy it, and get give the authorizations to your users. In addition, we have to set some parameters to get the connection to GitHub, to configure the Git repository, to name the Java engine, to initialize the system. This needs to be done before you can start working with GCTS. After you've done so, you can clone the repository, so somehow establish the connection between ABAP and Git. And then you can also create branches, or you can also simply start working with the master branch and create your first content. If you like to work with the CI server, with Jenkins, for example, then you would need to define the pipeline. But you can start trying out GCTS without that. OK. So with that, I'd like to show you a demo how GCTS in connection with the CI server could work. So we will have three systems. GIT is our development system, GIQ the test system, and GIP the production system. In addition, we will use a repository which is named CTS demo on GitHub. At first, we will create a new ABAP object and we will push the changes that we do in there to our feature branch. There is a Jenkins server which observes this feature branch. And if a new thing arrives in here, a new commit arrives in here, it will deploy it to our test system. On the test system, it will trigger some, yeah, a pipeline, it will do some tests and so on. We will also see what happens if we do something wrong. So we will repeat this a few times. As soon as we've reached a state that we say is ready for production, we will manually create a pull request to merge the feature branch into the master branch. And then we do have a second pipeline which observes the master branch. If something new arrives in there, this feature or this new stuff in the master branch will be deployed to our production system. OK, so let's do that. First of all, I'd like to show you around a bit in this GCTS Fiori app. So what you can see in here is a bit of a special edition of this GCTS Fiori UI. In the standard, you would call this UI in each and every system that you're working on. So on the development system, on the production system, on the test system. The specialty about this lay layout or about this view is that we do have the system list in here that is not available officially. So you would see more or less the right hand side of this UI if you call the GCTS Fiori app. OK, so what you will see on the first screen are the repositories that are configured. You can see what is the current commit and some additional information. An important thing in here is the virtual SID for the repository because this is how we can define which content goes into that repository. So the virtual SID is a non-ABAP system that is automatically created during configuration in TMS in the classical ABAP. And this is what you would use then as a transport layer for your ABAP coding. You could go then into the details of the repository. Sometimes you have to refresh. And you can see the same information and a bit more that we have seen before. So also in here, you have the version, uh, the virtual SID. You can see the commit. You can see the objects and some stuff. So you can also define if a repository is made for development or whether it's made for providing content into the system. That's only a question about if something is pushed or only pulled. On the first tab that is opened by default, you can see the commits that exist. So we are on this repository. If we go to GitHub, you could also use the link for sure into, I will come to that in a second, into the right branch and look into the commits. We can see the same commits that are shown in here. That's the commits that we can also see on GitHub. So that's how the connection is done. We can for sure see the same commits. OK. On the configuration tab, you can see some parameters. So what has been initially configured, just 
basic information. So nothing special configured in here, but there's option for many more parameters for many more things that you can do by configuring or by adding parameters in here. So one example, what you have to configure is the authentication. In this case, in 1909, we use a token. So that token is generated on Git for the repository, and then it's added in here as the authentication mechanism. In this case, that's the authentication for all users. In 2020, this changes. You could then also have user-specific authentication. But in 2020, uh, 1909, it's only per repository. OK, on the next tab, you can see the activities. So what has happened to your system? What was the commit? To which commit did it go? And all of these are links so that you can go directly to GitHub and check what has happened in this commit. You would also see the transport request that was used to create this commit. On the objects tab, you can see the objects that are involved or that are, had been transported via these commits. For my case, it's a very short list, but yeah, for sure you will have more in here when you start working with GCTS. One very important thing is the branches tab. There you can see the branches that exist. So feature and master, that's the same two that we have seen on GitHub. You can decide which of these shall be the active branch for your system. So for GIT, the feature branch is the active branch. We will see in a second that this is different for the production system. The branch that you use in here is the one where you push things to. And if you decide to go to a previous commit where you also pull things from. So that's really how this branching works. You can create new branches in here. These branches will then be available if you create a new one that one will also become the active branch. But you can at any time switch to any other branch. When you switch the branch, this means that the latest commit that is existing in this respective branch will be taken, will be imported into the other system. And by this, you can make sure that your system also uses the coding that is available in this branch. So that happens automatically when you switch the branch. On the log tab, you can see what happened. You can go into the details of the different actions and you can find information what happened. So a push happened, the current, uh, better start from the bottom. First, the latest state is pulled, the commit is created and then added with your new coding and pushed again back to GitHub. So this means the coding is overwritten, your new coding that is part of the transport request that you release becomes the active commit and for sure is also the active coding on your ABAP system. You can also go in more details if you need it. It's not that informative if everything is okay, but you can find all the details of what happened when this commit update and so on was done. If there was an error, you would see a red line in here. So it's quite easy to find the error and then maybe read the lines around it or the error itself to find out what might have been wrong. And we have one last tab with the properties where you can define dependencies between repositories or prerequisites and so on. But let's start with the basics today. So if you now look to the production system, for example, we can see it's the same repository for sure, because we need the same content. But if you look to the branches, we can see that in here, the active branch is the master branch. And that's because we would not like the latest coding to become active on the um, production system immediately. Only after we did the pull request and after we approved everything or whatever, how you like to set up your pipeline, only then the coding should become active on the production system. That's why we used a different branch in here. OK, so yeah, let's get started with some development. So I will use ADT for development. Let's close that, it's an old one. OK, so I'm logged on to GIT. And let's create, for example, a new package at first. We have to put it in the set namespace. That. 
and a description. not happen with the super package so that's nothing that you need in here we use the software component home and now we do have the important thing that's the transport layer so if you go to your development system the demo repository the virtual SIT, that's the important thing, though that's what defines the transport layer. So now we need the transport layer set DMO. Okay. Now let's also create a new transport request. Okay, so now we are done with our package. Okay. Let's add it to our favorites. So to find stuff. Okay. Okay, so we don't need the package anymore. And let's create a new ABAP class. So just some very simple coding. So that's the we use the same transport request as before so no new one needed in here okay so now i prepared some simple coding let's just paste it in here just adapt it slightly So it just does a very simple thing. It just creates a key value pair, hello world. So that's the class. And as we will use a pipeline that has to do, should execute some unit test, we need for sure program this unit test. In my case, this also means that I will copy the coding. Just also adapt it a bit. And you can see it does something very simple. It checks whether the key value pair is hello world. Okay, so that's it for our coding. Let's refresh the transport requests down here. And now we have something special implemented in this system. By default, a new commit will only be created when you release the transport request. But it might be that you work on the same transport request with many developers, then you might not want to wait until each and every developer finished his development before you can test your own coding. So that's why it's possible by implementing a body that you can create a new commit when releasing a task. And that's what we are going to do. So we have the transport request 662 and the task 663. So what we're going to do is we're going to release the task. And I hope that this is happening soon. Okay, now the task is released. So let's check what happened. So here we are on our development system. So we now expect a new commit. Oh, it's still on its way. It looks like it's a longer way today. Okay, so what you can see, the message that is used in here for this new commit is the same that I used as a title for the transport request or for the task. And that's also what you can see in the repository on GitHub. So if you go to the commits again, you can see the latest commit with community transport has arrived. Okay, so what I did not show to you up to now is that we also have a Jenkins pipeline. I'm sorry. Okay. 
and in there, there we have two pipelines. One is for the feature branch. This is what we just did. So we have created a new commit. Therefore, the pipeline is started. It does a build, it does a deployment, it executes a unit test. If required, it will do a rollback. We'll come to this in a second and it can do some cleanup. So that's the basic pipeline that we use. So it looks like the pipeline was passed successfully by our coding that we do, did. The unit test was okay. And that's somehow the trigger or the, the sign for the pipeline. It's okay, everything is good. So let's do something maybe not, that's not okay. Maybe someone decides world two shall be welcomed. We need a new task for sure. Activate that. So if we, what we did now should fail when the unit test is executed. So it doesn't mean that the coding is wrong, is wrong but our unit test expects something different. So this means in the pipeline, we would then expect that the pipeline re yeah, reports that the unit test was not okay. So here we do have our new task. I will also release it, but what we can do, we can say what we did. So give it somehow a commit description. That's how you could get meaningful commits or meaningful commit descriptions. Just add some text to the description of your task. You can also use the long description that requires that you set some parameters that we've seen before for the repository. But that is how you can describe what you did in your coding. Okay, so let's release that. Yeah, for sure I want to save what I did and then it's going to be released. So now let's go back again in our development system. There should now also be a new commit. So that's the one. The pipeline will hopefully start in a second. Okay, so now it's running. And this time we expect that the unit test is not passed successfully. And what the pipeline will do in that case, it will do a rollback. So this means that the previous commit that was okay, so where this pipeline was executed successfully for, will become active in the system again. This is something that you can do with GCTS. You can go to a previous commit. The coding of that previous commit will be activated and you will see the previous state available in your test system. With this, you can make sure that your test system is always up and running. So if another developer releases his task about different objects or whatever, then he will find a, develop, a test system that is in a healthy state. So he can use it, he can test his coding. And the other developer who provided this coding that is not working properly, has all the time he needs to fix his issues and then release his task again and get it deployed to the test system as well. This rollback is the real hard rollback. So it takes the coding as it was in that previous commit where the pipeline was executed successfully. It does not do or does not save any data that was ba created based on that coding. So it's not an option to do a rollback on a production system. Because if you, for example, changed some database fields, in the latest commit, the database field is extended, and then you go back to the previous commit and the database field becomes shortened again. All the data that requires the longer field will be lost. So there's no backup or saving of any data. That's why this rollback is only yeah, recommended to be used in these short CI dev cycles, not for any productive usage. Okay, having said that, the rollback is now done. So let's check what that means for our active commits. We are on the development system and let's refresh the commit list. We can see in here, it's still the latest commit that is active. So the pipeline is executed some on the test system. So that's why we now need to check what happened on the test system. In here, in the commit list, you can see the latest commit is available for sure. Maybe I should show that as well. On the branches tab, you can see that also in here, the feature branch is the active branch. So this system looks to the same branch. But 
the active commit is the previous one. So the rollback was done, as you've seen in the pipeline. That's why the previous commit is active and not the latest one where we added this Hello World 2 coding. OK, so let's repair stuff. So go back to our world. For sure, we need again a new task. And activate that again. And refresh our list. Let's provide a description again what we did and release the task. So this should now be OK again. Pipeline should become green. And the latest commit should be active both on the test and on the development system. So let's check test first. OK, the latest commit has arrived. Let's see whether test is already already ready. <laughs> OK, so there's still pipeline still running. The commit was visible, but the pipeline not yet executed. That's why the latest commit was not yeah, shown as active in the list. As soon as this is done, we will see that the commit with Hello World again will also be active on our test system. OK, so with that, we are now, let's say, ready. Our coding can go to the production system. So let's go to GitHub and create a new pull request. So in, in our setup, that's now a manual step that has to be taken because there's maybe some for I principle or whatever, how you would like to design the pull requests, some principle for reviewing required before you can put new stuff to the production system. OK, so let's say feature into master. That's what we need to do. Create the pull request. Some checks are done. OK, and confirm. So with this, we do not necessarily need the feature branch anymore for sure, but let's say we will also continue developing with it. But now our master branch on the production system is updated. We can see the three commits that we created plus the commit that results from the pull request. And this will now trigger or has triggered before <laughs> our second pipeline that looks onto the master branch. In this Pipeline, we decided for us that we do not do any unit tests anymore because everything was tested. But whether that makes sense or we'd like to put it different, that's for sure up to you, just to show that pipelines can be different. OK, so with this, we now provided our coding on the production system. So that was the demo that I wanted to show. Let's get to some news that we recently provided for GCTS. So one thing that you might need to set up the pipelines are the pipeline steps. You can find them in Project Piper. So I don't know whether you've seen that before, but this Project Piper is an open source project. SAP provides content in here where you can, for different scenarios, set up pipelines. So you can find many scenarios in here. You will find descriptions for these scenarios. And you can also find different library steps in here. So if you would like to set up a pipeline for GCTS, you can only use these pipeline steps that start with GCTS. There are also pipeline steps that start with ABAP environment. They are made for setting up pipelines in SAP Cloud Platform ABAP environment. There's also GCTS used in the background in SubCloud Platform ABAP environment when you transport a software component from one account to another. But that works a bit differently. So you cannot view this GCTS Fiori app that we've seen right now. You cannot work with your own repository up to now in SAP Cloud Platform ABAP environment. That's why the steps need to look different. So what we have seen in here was for GCTS on-premise systems. And that's what these five steps in here are made for. So we have three two steps that are more for the setup part so if you'd like to automate that via a pipeline you can set up one for step for creating a repository for cloning the initial content and then 
when your pipeline or when your sorry not your pipeline when your repository is ready you can set up a pipeline with the steps that we've just seen in the demo so you can have a step to deploy something you can have a step to run unit tests and you can have a step to run rollback so that's what we provide on project piper another thing that we recently provided is made to help you setting up gcts so there are some initial parameters as i said in the beginning that have to be set this wizard helps you guides you through the required steps so you need to define a directory where the local repository is cloned to. So when you have set up the repository on GitHub, you need to have it on your ABAP system as well, because this is from the, or in the GCTS setup in this environment, the local development environment. If you work with GCTS, there is no completely local development environment on each and every developer's machine. So there is no ABAP Docker containers up to now available that you could use for that. The somehow local development environment is the respective ABAP machine. And that's why you need to clone the repository to this ABAP system and not to your local computer. So this is the directory on this ABAP system where you would like to store these local repositories. Then, as I said, you need to set the Java runtime. You need to set a path to a Git client that's a part of the kernel. So you will find in the documentation what this means and how you can find the path to this Git client. And then you would need to schedule a job that is an observer job, which is somehow responsible for the communication so that whenever you release a transport request, the commit creation is triggered. This wizard is available starting with SAP HANA 2020 or with 1909 SPS3. For previous SPs or feature packs of 1909, you can make it available by implementing some nodes. We have a central node for GCTS where you can always find the most recent information. And in there, we also list the nodes that you need to implement to get the wizard available on your system. And I hope that we'll see it in a second. I can explain you a bit the structure of this node because I would before you start working with GCTS, I would also like to ask you, please look into this note to get some latest information. There's also a section about known issues. There's what's new and so on. And there is a table. You can look for your release. And then you can find out what are the most important notes. And for example, if you go for 1909 FPS 02, then you can find what to do to enable this wizard. So to get the wizard, implement node, these two nodes. Another thing that is part of this wizard as well in the end is the so-called health check. So when you finished your configuration or also at any later point in time, you can use this health check to get an overview about the configuration, if everything is okay, if, yeah, for example, authorizations are okay, if the connection to Git or GitHub or whatever works. So all of this is checked in this system health check. That's the same as for the wizard. So you need some SPs or some notes on the older releases or the older SPs of 1909, and you have it available in S4HANA 2020 or 1909 SPS 3. One thing special about this, if you called the health check before, changed some configuration because there was an error visible, for example, and then call the health check again, you should always use this refresh check because the checks that are done in here are something that require a lot of yeah, performance, a lot of time in some cases. And therefore we only recheck all the configurations on demand. And that's why you need to click refresh check when you open the check again. Okay. Customizing is only available for uh, to be able to work with TCTS in SAP S4 HANA 2020. For the workbench objects, we've seen that you have to use the right transport layer when you create a new object. In here, you would use the target system. So don't write, in our case, set DMO anymore, but just DMO. So the target system is always this virtual SID system that you created when setting up a repository. 
what it can do, it can transport TDAT and VDAT. So CDAT is not yet possible. We're working on that. I hope that it will be available soon. But for now, you can transport customizing data of type TDAT and VDAT. Tabu entries could also be transported before with pure workbench objects, but only creation and changes. And now with this enablement of customizing, we are also able to transport Tabu deletions. Another thing that goes hand in hand with this customizing or is a prerequisite for the customizing is the format of the repository. It defines how stuff is stored on GitHub. So the important thing, if you would like to use customizing, is that you have a repository of layout version 3. In 1909, all the repositories that you create do by default have the layout version 1. And you cannot change that. So if you like to use customizing, you have to create a new repository. And by default, all new repositories will then, in 2020, have layout version 3. With that, you can then choose the file format. Should it be JSON? Should it be XML? For the customizing support, that doesn't make any difference. You can choose both. In 1909, everything is stored in XML. In 2020, we offer this JSON option because it's easy or easier to read the stuff. If you look into the details of the different commits on GitHub, you will find a lot of files and information and so on that is created with each commit because we need all this information about the database. So where something has to be stored, how it is deployed, and all of this database information about the ABAP coding is required so that we can get it back into the next system for sure. All of this doesn't make the files very readable. The JSON format is a first step into the direction to improve readability a bit at least. But we are for sure working on more. So I cannot promise when it will come, but we hope that we in some future can also provide a really human readable file format for the different codings and so on. So for the class files and so on. Another thing that is quite new, it only came with S4HANA 2020, is the conflict resolution. So what we have seen in the demo is we just created a new content and we always moved straight forward. So we also did a fast forward merge from the feature branch into the master branch. But it can for sure easily happen that the master branch was also changed by some other feature two branch or however changes came into that. And then it should not be possible to just yeah, overwrite that with your latest commit. And that's why we need this conflict resolution. To be able to use conflict resolution, you would need to set two parameters for your repository. That's to disable the automatic pull and push functionality. So in 1909, when you release a transport request, by default, or in any case, the new stuff will be pushed and will be active. There's no, yeah, no change or no option to merge conflicts. In 2020, you can stop that behavior by setting these two parameters. And then you won't be able anymore to simply push new stuff if there is a change a commit available in the respective branch that is not available on your local system. If conflicts come up, you would then need to go to the objects tab of the um, GCDS Fiori app that we've seen before. And this tab has changed in 2020. So we will then see a list of conflicting files. And you can then click on this respective file. Clicking on it will bring up what we call a conflict resolution editor. So it's not a code check or whatever, but you can see the version of your coding that is available on GitHub and the version of your object as it's currently active in the respective ABAP system. Between these two, you can see a merge of the two with indicators about the conflicts. And then you need to go through all of these conflicts, resolve them, remove the indicators, and then save the final coding that you've created by merging. And when you've done so, you would then go back or automatically be redirected back to this objects tab. And then you would be able, you will get an additional button after you do so to commit and push 
first you need to stage, then you need to commit, and then you can push your changes into the remote repository. So that's how conflict resolution can be done in S4 HANA 2020. Okay, but that's not the end of the story. So we've seen what we can do in 1909 by yeah, executing a simple CI-CD process. In 2020, we've seen some additions for customizing and for merging conflicts. And for the future, we do have plans for more detailed support for some use cases. So we hope that we can support in the future a distributed development use case so that you do have, I will come to that in a second, but that you develop in different ABAP systems and get the chance yeah, to work with these, to merge all of these. So merging is for a first step and we'll come to more details in a second. And we will also hope, or we also hope to be able to provide some additional functionality when it comes to pull requests. So what we did now in the demo was we simply used the pull fun request functionality that is available in GitHub. But we hope to integrate that a bit better or more or at all <laughs> at first into the GCTS Fiori app. Also, an integration in the transport organizer is planned. And the exception handling and logging, yeah, also requires some improvement. So, working on that. Another thing that many customers are looking, are looking for is the integration of GCTS into the charm processes, so into change request management of SAP Solution Manager. That's also something that we plan for the future. That does not depend on a special release of GCTS, but on a special release of the SAP Solution Manager. And that's planned also for the near future. And we also provide or plan to provide some more convenience functionalities to simplify working with um, pipelines, to simplify setting up that, to provide maybe some additional pipeline steps that you can use to set up your pipelines. So let's look a bit more on the main use cases. So one thing is that we plan to support is this feature and maintenance in parallel. The idea in here is that if the same people, so the same developers, are working on new functionality and on maintenance, they might not need two systems anymore. So if a bug is discovered on production, you could activate some maintenance branch, which reflects the latest state of the coding on the production system. You could fix that bug, push it into the production system, and also merge it into the feature development. When you fixed your bug, then you could switch back your development system to the feature branch. So this means you can then continue working on your new development. And as soon as that is finished, you can also push that to production. So that's the idea that you can save a double system landscape. If you have different teams for sure that work on maintenance and on development, then you would also need the two systems because you cannot have two versions of an object active in an ABAP system at the same time. So all the ABAP runtime, the behavior of the SE80 of the developer's work range and so on, all of this stays the same as it is. So GCTS does not interfere in that. It only is integrated in the transport process. And therefore, if you need to do maintenance and um, feature development by different people at the same time, and you cannot organize it in a way that one or the other can be active, then for sure you still need two systems. Another use case that we have in mind is the distributed development. The idea in here is that for sure you cannot have a development environment for each and every developer on his laptop, but if you have really big development teams, <clears throat> you could have two development systems for the or more for sure for different development teams. Both of them can use with or can work with GCTS. Both of them can push their changes to different branches maybe on the repository. But therefore, on this setup, you would in any case need conflict resolution because then it can very easily happen that something is touched by both teams and conflicts need to be solved. The other thing is that you would need to know where things come from. So you would need, we call it a registry, an option to store information centrally who is responsible for which development object. And that's something that we don't have right now. We are working on that. But for this distributed development use case, we assume that this is a really primary prerequisite. So that's why we say distributed development is still somehow a planned use case. Okay, so on this very last slide, 
I collected all the links that we have. We have a documentation for sure in the SAP help portal. We have a guided answer that can help you if you have issues to find an answer. So you don't need to go through all of the documentation. The documentation is good to start with GCTS, to learn how it works, to set up the configuration, to set up your working environment. But if you find issues, then this guided answer can help you. And in this guided answer, you can then choose which is your issue. So you can start from where you are after it has loaded. OK, so first you would check for your release. Then you can decide, do I have an issue while configuring or while I was working on GCTS? And then you can check whether you find your issue in here. And if you do so, if you find something that matches with what you have done or what is going wrong, then you can find some answers in here. You can find sometimes hints on notes that might help. You can find links to documentation, topics, to special pages that can help, hopefully. So that's what this guided answer is made for. OK, and I have also listed some important notes. Most important one, that's the one that I already mentioned, is the central note for Git enabled CTS, where we collect all the new information that we have. OK, so with that, thank you very much. That was my presentation. And yeah, if there are questions, please yes, go ahead. There are a lot of questions, Karin. Okay. Thank you very much for <laughs> providing all the content. I think it's very interesting and I also our audience is very interested in. So maybe you can open the Q&A for you as well so that you can yeah. read the questions directly or maybe read them out loud. But I can start. So for example, first question was, uh, which integration is available with, with Charm? Yeah, the thing is, I cannot provide details right now because it's not yet available. As soon as it is, it is we can maybe think about having another session where we present Mm. how the integration works so it's yeah yeah okay okay yeah. do you want to go, go ahead, ahead? Would, yes please do you have any best practice for organization organization the new gcts course in the old world sap basis guys are managed set up cts but now they should have knowledge about git jenkins this is knowledge about other buttons yes sure so we don't have any best practices and as i said gcts it's not a must it is made for companies for situations where you feel that you need to go with ABAP into the direction of DevOps because maybe your company also or already uses DevOps processes, CICD processes for other development languages and ABAP has to go into that direction. And with that, hopefully you would have someone in your company who already knows a bit about how the processes should look like in your company. And then maybe the two can come together. But it's a bit hard to say it needs to be done that and that way because DevOps processes, responsibilities of developers, or if there's something or someone in between who has to approve stuff and so on, is always a bit different in different companies. So it's a bit hard to write a pure best practice. For sure, if we find out in the future that there's a way or a, yeah, a setup that is used in many companies, we will try to write something. But for now, sorry, we don't have something. Okay, GCTS only for S4HANA possible, not for ERP ECC. Yes, that's right. You need S4HANA 1909 at least. Um, is it possible to have the classical CTS and GCTS to be running in a parallel? Yes. How can we choose which release transports go to Git and which go through the classical CTS path? So that is done by setting the right transport uh, layer or you choosing the right target if it's customizing. Um, how to enable when we have a pure backend for all ABAP objects when we have different front end systems for Fury? Um, I'm not sure about that. So, you mean you develop? No. So, maybe you move on and we can yeah. ask uh, Harry um, if he can modify his question. Or maybe, yeah, I'm not sure about that. Maybe you can send me an email and I will try to clarify. Okay. Or ask a question in the community. I will try to clarify. Um, but so you would use different transport layers, I assume, right? And that's the same. So you can use different repositories with different transport layers and make the different front end systems look onto the different transport layers. Or if it's pure Fiori development, 
then there's also a pipeline for Fiori in Piper available. Um, I see HTTP in the URL, Fiori port, not HTTPS. Uh, to be <laughs> for sure, it can do SSL. All this configuration can be done via SSL. Um, normally, it should be SSL. I'm not sure where you've seen HTTP. Um, yeah, it was really in the beginning of the call. So okay. um, maybe this has, has been whatever. answered. Yeah. yeah, whatever. But HTTPS is for sure possible. And it's the standard and so on. So it should only be HTTPS. So I'm really not sure. If it's somewhere, then it's not good. OK. <laughs> then maybe, Winfried, you can contact um, Karin Weyer, SAP community. <laughs> and we will improve our setup. But yeah, anyhow, yeah. it should use HTTPS. OK. Um, if we don't use transport routes or STMS anymore, is it compatible with Charm on SAP Solution Manager? Yeah, up to, maybe that was asked before I <laughs> presented that. So yeah, we are working on that integration. In principle, you still use STMS somehow, but not a transport route. But yeah, there is an integration plan for Charm. Can we mix old STMS concepts and GCTS for deployment? Yes, but not for the same object. So it's not a good idea to have one object once transported via classical CTS and the next time via GCTS. So that should not happen. You deci should decide for each object which way to go. But it's possible to have both in one system at the same time, but as I said, for different objects. The UI we saw, is it an officially released app? Yes, it's part of the SAP basis. Um, there's a catalog, SAP basis TCRT, something like that, but it's in the documentation. So it's part of the SAP basis catalog. How would you set up a single Git repository where different branches should be deployed to different S4 HANA environments? We assume a scenario where we are providing a standardized product service to multiple different clients, make a new version of the product and want to roll this out to our clients. <laughs> that really depends on the case. So we would need to discuss details on how you would like, or who, how to manage access rights and all of this stuff. But for sure you can have different branches and everyone can, you can make it accessible for everyone. At SAP, just to make that clear, there are no plans up to now to use GCTS for any delivery of software. So it's all, the basic idea is more to use it for development inside one company. If you like to use it for delivery for to your customers, you can do so. It's not forbidden or whatever, but um, how you set up the branches that yeah requires some some thinking in advance, I would say. Karin, I yeah. have to interrupt you here because yeah. we have many, many more questions. Oh, okay. We are at the point of... Roll bar doesn't shrink. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, so I think maybe what about writing a summary of this call with the questions integrated in that summary in the SAP community. So everyone mm -hmm. can read this afterwards. So when you follow Karin in SAP community, and I paste here again the link, then you can see that when she published your content, and also, as I said, the recording will be available. And maybe some of your questions will have already been solved during the presentation. Um, so. I will close the call please, for today. Yeah. Yeah. Could you please export me the? the of questions? course, Karin will get <laughs> all your questions. Yeah, this is a very okay. good hint. Mm -hmm. Of course, Karin will get all of your questions. So everything will um, get an answer as well in the blog post. So I can only say a huge thank you for the great audience uh, for all your questions and Karin also for all your explanations. Thanks very much and. Um, I close the call now and hope to talk to you soon sometime. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you, bye.